This is the last part of our antibiotic susceptibility lecture. And we're going to discuss some of the rapid tests that are done in the clinical laboratory. So some of these rapid tests are looking for beta-lactamase production, to look for chloramphenicol resistance in haemophilus species, and as well as our automated instrumentation that does all of the susceptibility testing as, in addition to the biochemical tests for identification. So there's a very quick and easy method to, do, to test an organism's ability to produce a beta-lactamase, which would be indicative of penicillin or cephalosporin resistance. So there's a starch iodine method where this is a colorimetric test where your penicillin will break down products and bind to iodine and make a color reaction. So no color would be positive and a color reaction would be negative. You could do a pH method where you get, a, there's a pH indicator in the test and again you'd get a color change if the pH changes. And you could do a cephalosporin chromogenic substrate, which is a more sensitive method. And this is the test that most clinical laboratories use if they actually do this test. So what happens is when the beta-lactam ring is opened up, this little disc turns red. So the substrate is nitrocephin, and you have cephanase discs or strips. So here's a picture of this cephanase disc. There's a B because the beta sign because it's testing for beta lactamase. And on the left you can see that it's bright red which would confirm a beta lactamase producing organism. On the right it didn't turn red so that would be negative. Now we have our automated test. You want to grow your bacteria. You want to apply the correct concentration of bacteria, whether it's a McFarland standard, whether it's another methodology. But with your automation, instead of having to wait overnight for or 24 hours, whatever the disk diffusion might be or your e-test, you have to incubate overnight, you can get your results in three to six hours. So some of the common methods used in clinical microbiology laboratories, the instrumentation, this is an old instrument, but the VITEC is one method that's used in the clinical micro laboratory to do bacterial identification using all the biochemical testing as well as susceptibilities. And here is the microscan walkaway instrument. Um, this is another common instrument that does your identification and susceptibilities. This is the card that the Vitec automated instrument uses. So you actually would make your suspension and inoculate this little card. The microscan actually uses a normal 96 well plate and you can see the different tests in each well. Now with antibiotics there's something called synergy. So one drug alone might have one effect on an, a, an organism. And another drug alone might have another effect on an organism. So for example, on the far left, we'll see synergy. Drug A in, doesn't really kill at all the bacteria. It doesn't really do that much different than the control without any drug. Drug B does kill the bacteria a bit, but it's not wonderful. You may not want to use drug B. It's not that effective. Synergy is an effect that you get when you combine two drugs together.
So for so drug A and drug B, drug A doesn't work at all, drug B just works a little bit. Yet when you combine drug A and B together, look at that. After 24 hours, there's absolutely no organisms left. It completely kills the bacteria. So that is synergy. Antagonism is when one drug may not work at all. Another drug does work. When you put the two together, the one that does work, in this case drug D, doesn't work as well. So the one drug is antagonizing the other drug. So you wouldn't want to combine your drugs that are acting in, a, in an antagonistic fashion. Indifference is when you have a drug that doesn't work at all, drug E. Drug F that does work. When you combine drug E and drug F, there's no difference. It still works the same as drug F. So again, you may not want to combine them because there's no difference with using drug F alone. So the key is, is if you can get a much better response when you use a drug in combination, that's synergy, and that would be a reason to use a combination of two drugs together. So we're going to end off with a case study. There's a 68-year-old man goes to the universe, goes to the emergency room. He's had a history of fever, night sweats. He doesn't have any lesions on his skin. They did collect blood cultures because of that history of fever, and the blood cultures were positive for Staphylococcus aureus. Now the susceptibility studies showed that that Staphylococcus aureus isolated from the blood was resistant to penicillin and methicillin. So points to consider when you're looking at case studies. You want to think about the mechanism of action of a specific antimicrobial agent. You want to think of how that organism might become resistant to that agent. Is it producing a beta-lactamase? Is it producing a penicillinase? Staphylococcus aureus does produce penicillinases. It produces beta-lactamases. It has it might have mech A, which is going to change the binding site. So you always want to think of what alternative treatments can be used. What tests might you need to do to confirm something? So another case study, you have a viridin streptococcus that was isolated from a blood culture bottle, collected from a patient that had was suspected of having bacterial endocarditis. That makes sense, right? Viridin streptococcus is one of the streptococcus organisms that it commonly causes bacterial endocarditis because it's normal flora of the mouth. Now that isolate was shown to be susceptible shown to be, um, the susceptibility to penicillin was shown to have an MIC that was less than or equal to 0 0.03 micrograms per mil. Now the MBC, minimum bactericidal concentration, was requested and it was reported as 32 micrograms per mil. So the patient was placed on penicillin and gentamicin. So what was the purpose of determining the MIC and the MBC? So you remember the MIC is just inhibitory concentration and the MBC is bactericidal. The MBC is commonly much higher. You need a larger concentration of antimicrobial agent to absolutely kill an organism than you might need to just inhibit its growth. However, for that, for that specific organism, the, MI, the MBC was much higher than the MIC. So the MBC is, is usually higher, but that was very much higher, which might indicate that penicillin alone may inhibit the growth perfectly fine but may not kill off that infection and for a gram positive infection you might want to kill that organism. You don't usually want to kill off a gram negative organism and I hope all of you know why 
because gram neg negatives have LPS, lipopolysaccharide, which is endotoxin. Endotoxin is released when gram negative bacteria are killed. So you would not want to kill off everyone's gram negative bacteria and release a huge amount of endotoxin because that could lead to septic shock and death. But for a gram positive organism where you don't have the lipopolysaccharide, you do want to kill off that organism. Also, for this, penicillin and gentamicin have a synergistic result. So one of them might be effective, one of them might not be as effective. You put them together and they're very much more effective. So you always want to consider that synergy when you're thinking about antibiotics. So for this lecture, you always you want you want to know the mechanisms of action that antimicrobials use to kill bacteria. So what are they targeting in the organism? Are they targeting the beta-lactam ring? Are they targeting the peptidoglycan? Are they targeting DNA gyrase? You want to know the mechanisms of resistance by your different organisms. So you want to know that bacteria can produce enzymes like penicillinase and beta-lactamase. You want to know that they might have an efflux pump where they're pumping out antimicrobial agents as they come in. So all of those different resistance mechanisms you should be familiar with. You want to be able to understand the different methodologies of performing your susceptibility tests. So how do you do a disk diffusion test? How do you do a broth dilution test? And what do they mean? What do the results mean? You want to be able to understand sources of error. So we said that our susceptibility testing has to be extremely standardized. So what would happen if you were doing a disk diffusion test and you didn't use a standard agar plate, a commercial agar plate? You poured your own agar plate and you made the agar twice the thickness of what it's supposed to be. Think about how that's going to affect your test result. So you have a thicker agar. The disc is containing antibiotic. It's going to diffuse through the agar. If that agar is thicker, it's not going to be able to diffuse as far out as it normally would for agar in its normal thickness. So you might get a falsely narrow or smaller zone of inhibition if the agar is too thick. So you really need to understand the susceptibility testing in order to understand what might happen if you add too much bacteria. If you have agar that's too thin or too thick, you will see questions like that on the next, next exam. You have to understand this concept. And also the modifications for testing your fastidious organisms and as well as some of those specialized confirmatory tests for your resistant organisms. So how to test for um, MRSA, doing your D testing, how to test for an extended spectrum beta lactamase producing organism. So you need to know how to do all the tests, understand what the results mean, and understand what would happen if a test were not done correctly. So remember, use antibiotics wisely. Most of your coughs and sore throats are caused by viruses where an antimicrobial agent will not work anyway.